at this hour. Last session, I guess we're, the, we're on deck for Soledad O'Brien, so very excited about that. Um, before we get into it, why don't I have my colleagues here introduce themselves so I don't uh, okay. misspeak. I can go first. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Diana Kowalski. I head up internal communications at Petco, based in San Diego. So it's been great to be here and tell people where I work, and everyone pulls out their phone and shows me their pets, the best. So, oh. I'm Rosie Cayetano, um, the senior manager for operation systems. I deal with all the bells and whistles um, in staff base um, and other software applications. Where do you work? Where you work. Oh, hi, I'm Lucas Skippers. <laughs> I'm the senior manager for internal communications at Mr. Car Wash, where Rosie and I work. And we're excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and for those of you who I don't know, I'm Jeff Corbin. Um, I think I was introduced as principal strategic advisor for internal communications at Staff Base. Uh, just quickly, a little bit about myself. I have been in your shoes for many, many years. I used to be the CEO of a communications consulting firm. Uh, here in New York City. Um, I joined Staff Base about three years ago, really for the purpose of helping our customers to be successful in putting into place and executing on their internal communications technology strategies. So, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. The one thing I just want to start off by saying before we get into the topic of our conversation is just the aura of this event. Um, I've been to a lot of internal comms events over the years and just seeing so many hundreds of people. I think this is probably the largest that I've been to here in North America. So great celebration of this industry and uh, next year it's going to be even better. So thank you all for, for coming and thank you all for being here today with us. Um, so the topic is how do we get our organizations on board? Um, the thing that's interesting about all of you here is that you're kind of in the same industry, but not really. You're all retail. You have a lot of frontline workers. Maybe you could talk a little bit about each of your companies, how they're, the folks are dispersed. Um, yeah. Sure. Go for it. Go for it. Want us to start? Yeah. yeah please. Why don't you start? And all right. So <laughs> we have 450 locations. Um, we operate in 23 states from coast to coast. Uh, we have about 7,000 employees. 5,000 of those employees, about 5,000, are frontline hourly folks. Um, the rest is our leadership team. Um, we're, we're currently, our, it's our leadership team that's currently in staff base, enrolled. Our hourly folks are not. We're looking to get them in soon. Very soon. We're excited about. Cool. Yeah. Um, now, if we could get you to wash pets, like dog wash. We actually do have, have some dog have washes. Dog wash. at, okay, yeah. see, yes. it, you're right, you're more right than you know. Um, Petco, who, who shops at Petco? Oh good, look at you all. Uh, we have 1,600 stores in all 50 states, some in Canada in partnership with Canadian Tire, some Mexico, um, 29,000 employees by and large. Many are our part-time store workers, about 75% of our workforce. And we have two uh, headquarters. We have eight distribution centers, so pretty classic consumer retail organization. Great. And so, yeah, so the, the challenge, obviously, is yeah. communicating with these folks who yes. you don't see on a daily basis that are typically pretty difficult to communicate with, right? Very much so. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think back over the past several years, a lot has happened in this industry, right? Um, the pandemic, um, now we have this economic situation on our hands. I'm interested to know, if you think back two, three years ago, 2020, early 2020, how has uh, internal communications evolved at each of your, of your companies, or has it not? Mm -hmm. I can go. Um, it's all a blur, of course. It's, we call it the COVID time warp, and I feel it to be true. Um, I remember, I mean, a couple of thoughts. One is I remember when my team sent the email that sent our entire headquarters home, and then a few days later, we were talking to our CEO, and he like looked at me and was like, I don't know what to do now. And I was like, 
I mean, I guess we'll have you do a weekly update to the organization and nobody knew what we were doing, nobody knew what to do, and it was just this really humbling moment. And I think one thing for communicators like we all are is that like, I've worked at REI, I've worked at PECO now, and it's like the, there was value in internal communication, so that, that was never a question, but it's like, how do we courageously step into that moment and like help direct when nobody knew what to do and see what worked and see what didn't? And I think about, you know, well, to me, the core of like how we do our work um, hasn't changed a ton, but like the importance and urgency has. And I, you know, it's like, how do we keep that courageous moment with you as we move forward? It's something that comes to mind for me. I don't know about you all. So for us, we were in the middle of contract negotiations mm -hmm. with staff base when COVID happened. Mm -hmm. um, so at Mr. internal communications was a concept that was new. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Carwash, it's an uh, old company, but sort of has a startup operational mentality. Mm -hmm. um, so think of like a big greyhound that thinks it's a lap dog. <laughs> That's sort of the way we've operated for a very long time. Um, so during contract negotiations, we were still trying to secure executive leadership buy-in. Um, and then bam, COVID hit, um, where we're operating in different states. We're trying to track you know, different ordinances in different counties in some mm -hmm. situations, state by state. We're tracking all of those because we have to change our policies and our operational procedures in real time. It would have been great to have aggregated channels. Gosh, it would have been so great. So <laughs> <laughs> push notification. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, that would have been wonderful. Um, so it was sort of a, I mean, a lot of, stressful things happen with COVID, but the one sort of guiding um, takeaway from that is we really need this tool. Like we came out of that and we were like, we've got to get this, we've got to get it off the board, off the ground, we got to get it implemented, we have to have a way to talk to our people. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really helped us um, as soon as we were back up and operating as usual, that was like the first thing we did. Can, can you talk a little bit about uh, the relationship that you had with your leadership teams? Um, how did you, uh, you know, convince them that something was needed, some sort of change, whether it was you know, philosophical or technological? Um, how, how, did that, how did that play out? I mean, we had, and Rosie can speak more toward the, the topic of how we got our leadership on board with staff base, but I can tell you that prior to that, we had a few failed intranets that one of them is still kind of hanging around to my embarrassment. But, um, and, and I think that be, uh, part of the reason why those, those intranets failed is lack of functionality. And also because, as Rosie said, sort of a conservative organization, there was this sense that ugly emails are sufficient. Um, and in fact, not just sufficient, but preferred. Which to me now is almost like, I don't know how you could possibly have thought that, the you and the you know, ether. But I think the, where we are now is having proven that what we have done is far better and far superior to ugly old emails with occasional newsletters. Um, I don't think we could afford to go back. But anyway, that's just my yeah. sense of it. I would say too, you know, thinking about um, communications and the importance of it and convincing leadership of it is that you know there's been such a seismic shift in the world about working and how to work and what people want and you know people jumping jobs and jumping all around and um, companies really sort of reeling from that I think one thing that has helped me get our leaders on board with the necessity of tools whatever it is is really being seen as the person who knows what the sentiment is, knows what the vibe is out there in the organization and like proactively tells them because that's the information that they don't see. You know, they're in meeting after meeting after meeting and are mostly, unless they do a store visit or something, pretty isolated from what people really think and want and feel. And 
at least in my experience, when you can deliver that to them and tell them, like, this is why we need this and these, this is the real deal and tell them what sentiment is, where sentiment, sentiment is bad, where it could be better, it really helps sort of build that credibility and trust with them so that when you say, and then this will fix that problem I've been telling you about, they're more willing to listen. Yeah, so I, you and I participated in a, in a discussion, one of our comms clubs uh, mm -hmm. several months ago in Seattle, and um, I tell this story about uh, a, a friend of mine who happens to be the CEO of a very large um, uh, beauty company here in the United States. And uh, he, so I asked him what his, like what does he expect from the, communic the communications professionals that, that work from him? What he said is, I expect them to be walking the hallways and standing at the proverbial water cooler and really understanding what our employees are looking for, what they want to hear from me, yeah. their CEO, and then to report that back. That's what I expect. And when I heard that, I said to myself, you know, that's how we build relationships yeah. with leadership, right? You're, you have employees who are manning car washes that are, you know, mm -hmm. s selling pet supplies. How do you do that? How do you, how do you get to know what they what they want to hear and then advise your your uh, your leadership? I, I think it helps in our case that we have uh, Mr. Carwash a really strong and well defined culture in the organization, mm -hmm. and so it's really actually not all that difficult to figure out what what people resonate with because they resonate with stories that reflect what we're about. We're we're very much about. Um, empowering employees, promoting from within, creating careers in an industry that's historically not been associated with, you know, careers. It's traditionally been seen as, um, you know, low engagement, short-term employment. So for us, that's really not the challenge. The challenge is more identifying the individuals who, whose stories we can tell that represent and empower and inspire people. And so that's where we have kind of a mixture of luck and then, you know, beating the pavement and reaching out and encouraging people to provide us leads. And that's just if we're talking about employee profiles. I bring that up because that's what people really people dig in our company a lot. And I also think employing the use of in-market content creators mm. through the aggregated channels has been a game changer for us. Um, those are the channels that have the highest readership rates um, and those drive the most engagement because they're talking to each other. Right. Mm -hmm. right. um, a couple of things for me, and that's interesting that more local content creation is interesting. From a like, I, I would say we employ formal and informal ways to like know what's happening around the business. I mean, I've memorized basically our engagement survey. If you all have engagement surveys, I, I like have to beg HR sometimes to like give me all the cuts of the data, but that's super important and helpful. Um, and then also, I mean, the power of a network can't be understated. Like, I know who in the organization is like the gossip people, which is good, <laughs> bad, but also good in that you make friends with them and then they tell you what the rumor mill is, which you have to know in order to dispel the rumors. Um, and then just really having a, I have a solid group of like a dozen store managers that I trust and you talk to them and then you hear what's up and you understand what themes are resonating or not out there. And then we actually do a, a quarterly um, sentiment report, which sounds fancier than it actually is, where we just serve up to our leaders. They haven't asked for it, but we give it to them. Just, you know, where is engagement high? Where is it low? What are the top, like, Ru top rumors, like our executives are like, really? That's what people are worried about? And it's like, yes, yes. So that's helpful too. Great. Yeah. So um, in the audience, we have a mix of existing customers of staff base across our various okay. channels, uh, products, also folks who are not uh, staff based customers. And I know one of the questions that we get asked a lot is, you know, how do we make the case for a new solution like like staff base we are limited in resources um 
Yeah, so Diana, you use our email mm -hmm. uh, platform. Uh, Mr. Carwash uses App Intranet. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process that you uh, went through, I guess, back you know, pre-pandemic, early days of the pandemic to get that buy-in? Mm -hmm. You wanna go for it? You start. So when we selected staff base, we looked at 14 vendors. 14. We had, um, a, we started though, we did a needs assessment and we went to every sort, every corner of our business and asked them, you know, what is it that our current intranet, our current newsletter, our current form of communication, what is it that it, we're not doing? What information do you need? How, how do you want your team to reach employees? Um, and then we had some more structured questions. And we identified what each department's needs were. And we created sort of a report card. Um, and then we got representatives from each corner of our business and formed a evaluation committee. And we put 14 um, companies through the ringer and uh, staff base was like the resounding choice. And for me going through that, like I was 100% sold on staff base. Um, but once we actually implemented it, um, you know, seeing how simple it was, because so one of the things I was charged with when we were trying to get executive buy-in buy was trying to show them like what this looks like. So I populated all these channels with content and built out everything I could possibly think of that would blow their socks off. And, um, but doing that, like it sounds like this huge feat. If we were building that in SharePoint, oh my gosh, I, I think I'd still be building it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the ease of just making something so beautiful and so easy so that you know, content creators and writers and communicators can really focus on the message and not on getting it to the readers was huge. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that, because you said that very well, is that going forward, you know, once you've got the buy-in, then of course you have to retain it, and that's really the key thing, right? Because it can go away, which is the paranoia that we all have to live with. <laughs> and so the thing that I appreciate, because I have a very small team, it's just me and two other people who report to me, the thing that's really great is that we can find out what our audience is interested in, like what features do you guys out there in the car wash land want to see, what do you want to be able to do, and some things we just can't do at present because it's just beyond the capability, but there are a lot of things that we are able to do, and we can iterate to them with minimal work. You know what I mean? Like, they, like what Rosie said about SharePoint, she'd still be building it if we were using SharePoint. That's absolutely true. And for us to have like an idea like, hey, they want this. We think we can do it. Let's just try it and see if it works. And we can kind of get past the troubleshooting stage to it's actually working. And I just want to really quickly say a, a success story for us is it was kind of like an embarrassing thing that our CEO wasn't really in Mr. Connect, which is what we call our staff base. It was embarrassing to me anyway. Um, and we launched a feature our, our folks in, in, in car wash world wanted a kind of an asynchronous chat platform where they could post questions and get answers from each other about like how do you clean wraps or how do you keep your tunnel walls clean? You know, all the things that keep car wash people up at night. <laughs> um, and we said, you know, I think we can use the update channel and I think we can kind of just apply that and it's not perfect, but it gets about 95% of the way there. We launched it. We had a few little bumps by middle of the week, we had corrected them, and I was so um, pleased to see that there was a post by John Lai, CEO of Mr. Car Wash, responding to one of the questions about what books do you rep recommend for leadership? And he just went in there and he said, I recommend this one. So of course, you know, there's probably like a thousand of those books checked out all across Car Wash. Right? <laughs> but I mean, that wasn't something where I reached out to John and say, hey, John, go in there and and post because he wouldn't have done it if I told him to anyway. <laughs> um, but the fact that he did that, I don't know, I, like to me that was like a real win. So I patted myself on the back. Yeah. Great. What about you, Diana? Um, I, you know, thinking about this and like Jeff said, we have the email tool, which is one of the tips that I think about, which is 
Sometimes it helps to start smaller because it's hard for leaders to swallow the pill of a large dollar investment sometimes. So it's like, how do you pace the investment? How do you think about starting with this? And then in the second half of the year, you want to put this in, like, like all the other parts of the business think about investing in their tech stack and tools. Um, and then just being ready with the um, plan A and plan B. I mean, honestly, the email tool for us was fairly easy because we had nothing, which is, as many of you probably know, it's like the black hole of email is the worst thing ever. So it wasn't hard to convince them. And it also wasn't that high dollar amount in the long term. So that's one way in is start small and go bigger. And then also, like, I would say, we just heard some good tips in the ROI session, but it's like be uh, confident in claiming some of the scores that don't directly like engagement or you know productivity or some of those things that like people are always like, well, but it's not just communications, but it is communication. So like claiming and standing firm on some of those measures helps solidify our case for what we need, right. I feel. And I, I guess there are really two aspects to the ROI yeah. equation, right? There's how does the tool help us as communications professionals? And we all know that technology is intended to help us be more mm -hmm. efficient, more effective in, in our work, and time is money, so um, that's, you know, that's why. Um, then there's also what is the impact of the technology, the solution, your ability to be more efficient, on the business and the operations and the top line, bottom line. And so I guess the question is, how has technology helped you with both? Well, I mean, I think in our case, like if we're in a challenge to what is the ROI translating into business objectives. So one of the metrics that is crucial to our business is our capture rate because we have a subscription based model. It's called the unlimited wash club. Lots of car washes now have it. And uh, we, we monitor that very closely, and obviously a higher capture rate is good for us because it means we're converting retail, retail customers into members, which is what we want. And middle of last year, um, there was an idea. It didn't originate with us. It came from outside of our little corner, but we'll go ahead and, and insert ourselves into the <laughs> equation to do kind of like a, like a competition, which we called Mr. Madness, to juice up um, capture rate. And so it was through Mr. Connect and our messaging that we used that we were able to drive for our field managers, not just the details of the contest, because obviously that's critical, but also the progress that was being made and then celebrating the victor and just creating a lot of buzz about it. And so we saw, despite a time of declining retail volume due to the ongoing macroeconomic climate, which sucks, but we saw our, our capture rate actually increase substantially during that time, um, which was attributable to that contest very clearly if you look at the metrics. So that's just an example of how we were able to leverage. And that's just one example, but it's Great. one that most comes to mind. Great. Yeah. We also think about retention and all of that, especially now, is a good one that we can point to our cultural moments and the content we put out and the engagement we get. Um, we can tie to retention as well. And I think, you know, I mean, on the flip side of our teams, we all have small teams. I have a team of three people. Um, it is helpful when, I mean, AI is going to solve all our problems, right, everybody? Um, mm -hmm. When we can spend more time thinking about what problem we're solving mm -hmm. for the company, I find it's much more of a productive conversation, especially with C-level leaders, when, when you're focused on the problem you're solving rather than just getting out the comms and mm -hmm. spending time, which is important. You have to do that. But like having conversations with them about problems to solve, it's much more fruitful for, you know, then we need investment in comms and tech to get to that problem mm -hmm. solved. Right. You, you, had taught, you had spoke about um, your employee engagement survey. I forget yeah. how you referred to it. Yeah. Um, have you seen that change? Have you done like a compare and contrast, you know, from when you first started working with us to? Uh, yeah, to, I would uh, say um, 
So our emails that we send out, I mean, primarily they go to our two support centers and our field leadership because our hourly folks don't have email for many reasons, of which I could argue over a beer at some point. <laughs> um, but we have seen an uptick in um, awareness and interest in our support center groups um, around what's going on on campus. We also had to do the whole come back to the office thing that I'm sure you all have too. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have seen an uptick in specifically support center audiences um, in engagement over the last year and a half since we've been using the tool. Yeah, so I that's think, great. Yeah, and I think I think it, I mean to the extent that you do do surveys, many companies that we work with do, and yeah. there's always a component of it so about communications and transparency mm -hmm. You know, for companies that maybe haven't done a survey of yeah. that sort or are gonna do a, a new one, You know, to, to really focus in on that because the results that we see are that um, the needle does move. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, for the Mr. Carwash folks, um, how would you say your use of wor working with us at staff-based or technology in general has changed the way that, you know, would change your work? Um, so we've been able to look at a lot of different operational processes that we did and look at ways to sort of streamline them and make them cleaner and easier um, and then collect information that we can use, like actionable insights mm -hmm. that we can actually make decisions with data, which is revolutionary <laughs> in some situations. <laughs> um, that custom plugin feature, um, we were able to develop um, a special little tool just so every day our managers can give us sort of metric based, but also, you know, just experiential information about what they're seeing. It's dinner, dinner table conversation about what they saw at their store. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can take that data and port it into our BI tool and really make decisions on that. Whereas it used to be in like a PDF library that was like on a SharePoint site that you could click through for 450 sites. Yeah. So I mean, just little things like that it's pretty, pretty big, though. Yeah. Huge. When, Huge. I, when I go to meetings now with other um, representatives from other business units at the company, um, I always you know, have my laptop, and I always have Mr. Connect keyed up, because I know that at some point, we're probably going to be talking about what they need to do or what they want to do. And it's very helpful for me to be able to open up Mr. Connect and point to it and say, so this is what you want to be able to do. This is what we can offer to get you to that end. And so by doing that, we can kind of insinuate ourselves in other business units, and, and that sort of sounds bad, but um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a positive outcome because it means that we're integrating ourselves within the organization. So not only are we getting more pipeline of information coming in, but we're also becoming important to their functioning, mm -hmm. which yeah. means it's a continual cycle that yeah, is positive. It, it's weird, but it's like the fact of having a tool lends legitimacy to mm -hmm. the whole operation in a weird way, which it shouldn't have to, but it kind of does. And it's also helped us really take control of our editorial. Like I know some, some conversations today about like spending all this time taking inbound requests versus proactively thinking about the calendar ahead of time and having Step eight as a tool has really allowed us to like we're much more purposeful with our editorial like mm -hmm. going out a quarter and then we can say oh no we we aren't going to do your thing that we shouldn't be doing anyway because we have all this other stuff like <laughs> it allows us to take control of the narrative in a way that is really helpful um it was earlier travis um, did a presentation on campus mm -hmm. and he had these questions that were posted and one of the questions was uh, something like, you know, do you have communications going out that you were not aware of? Or, yeah. And it's funny because I feel like the longer and the more um, people adopt Mr. Connect, our, our application, um, the less that's happening. Mm -hmm. And it's really because departments are proactively coming to us yeah. and it's a, like a collective effort as opposed to publishing stuff and hoping we don't find out. 
which was sort of we, <laughs> really. We, 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 <laughs> we still have rogues, though. That's oh, very interesting. We do have rogues, but we're reining them in. It's, yeah. Oh but, my God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I always said um, it's been a decade that if we had the ability as communications professionals to know what is resonating, what's not, what's working, it would save us so much time, right? And, and now we have that opportunity to yeah. really dig into, you know, what, what do people care about? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer here, but, you know, <laughs> tough times in the economy. Um, we're hearing it. I think every industry is, is hearing it. Companies are evaluating. Uh, you know how to spend their their precious dollars, and you know obviously they're going to each of the business units, communications included, to make the case for continued um, budget. Um, what's the conversation in each of your convers in each of your companies, and how are you justifying you know technology, staff base, anything at this at this point? I mean, I think for us. We're fortunate in that the conversation hasn't yet come up directly. I mean, I'm sure it might be happening that I'm not aware of, but nobody's come to me and said, hey, you need to justify your existence. I think, <laughs> I think though, that you have to justify that every day that you go to work, right? Like, that's something that you have to prove all the time. And I think in our case, being able to, one, tie the platform into the culture, that, that the platform has to amplify and protect and defend that culture because that's the the one um, irreplaceable asset that the company has is is what your unique culture is, and then beyond that, that you can leverage it in ways that once you've done so, people cannot envision what it would be like to not have it there. Mm. And so I feel like we probably are getting to that point. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's maybe rash mm -hmm. to say we're not there, you know, mm -hmm. we're there yet, but I think we're finding ways to reach out to many departments that in the past have been very isolated and, and bring them into a broader fold. So. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's easier said than done, but like it, it's like making the platform so good that people couldn't imagine not having it is true. And I think also it's about making sure the people who need to hear it hear all the feedback about it that isn't just you, you know what I mean? Like, of course, I'm gonna say our tool is amazing, we have to have it, but like, if they're hearing it from employees across the organization, leaders hearing it from others as well as us, that really helps build legitimacy too. And then I will, like I said earlier, I think it's, you know, like every business unit has to be smart about spend and pacing and like, okay, I can wait six months for this tool, but like, that's fine. And in the meantime, here's what we're going to do to address it. Because we know, I mean, we know budgets are what budgets are. And mm -hmm. also not being super Pollyanna as a communicator is like, you can't be either. Um, but if you make it really good and you're smart about how you pace it, I think those are the conversations that build credibility. Even if you don't get what you want every time, you're speaking to the business in a way they understand. And it's not just you saying the platform is amazing. Employees are saying it, right. that mm -hmm. helps too. I think, I think one of the things, Lucas, that you, that you said that really gets me excited um, is the fact that it's, communications isn't just communications anymore. We're now act being act proactive and going out and yes. becoming an, a value value added resource partner to the different business units and yeah. i think that that's a key message that you know we don't want to just be paper pushers right we want to you know let the other parts of our business know that we're here to support we understand what's going on and then uh, report that back to, uh, to, to, to leadership yeah. so i think that that's really really cool and hopefully you know a solution like staff base uh, enables that to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the great things about the application, um, just looking at it from a, like a sustainability perspective is it's always being updated and there are so many um, options, plugins, the custom plugins that can make it so that you can incorporate the application into your operations 
so that you really can't have a world without it. Mm -hmm. Like for us, I think it would be, it would substantially affect how we do things to go back. I mean, because we've adopted so many new, sustainable, effective processes right. that affect so many other processes. So I think that's a really great aspect of the tool. It's not just messaging, it's like what else you can do. Because you can live without a newsletter, but when your employees are going in and submitting their water quality test reports that they have to yeah. do every week, you, you suddenly change the nature of the discourse from, you know, this is a nice story yeah. to this is something we need to do our work. Yeah. yeah. Right. Stories are important, but building utility in into it as well a nice totally story. makes sense, yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure that we leave time for, I have one like big picture question, but I'm going to hold out on that one. Um, open the, uh, you know, the floor here to questions. I'm sure there are lots, whether it's practical, philosophical, how do we be the best in our industry? I see it one hand raised up in the middle. Do we have runners. Is, it, is there a mic? Is there a mic? Is there a mic? A runner? Oh yes, I see someone. <laughs> If not, maybe you could stand up, introduce stand up. yourself. And They're coming your way. Hi, Laura Wilker from River Spring Living. Um, we have also have a lot of frontline employees who don't have email. Um, and I know you made a comment about them having emails. And yeah. I'm just curious about how you actually do reach those frontline employees, if you reach their managers and they have daily stand-ups to yeah. relay the information, or if you have digital screens, or, or if you encourage them to download their app on your app on their personal devices, or how you work that, because we're kind of going through that transition now. Go for it first. So um, our, our um, frontline workers do not have email. Um, and so, and we haven't fully rolled out to our, our, our hourly folks yet. We're in the process, but we have all the, the infrastructure. We did roll out to a large audience of this subset earlier this year. Um, so we've had some results from that. Essentially what we do is we walk them through the application, we get them registered at the store site on store devices. And then we make it very clear that if you want to download it on your personal device so that you can enjoy all the bells and whistles of Mr. Connect when you want to, feel free to do it. We'll walk you through it right now. Mm -hmm. um, we're very careful about making sure that our content is aggregated so that those audiences are getting nice to know information without calls to action. Mm -hmm. um, so that if those employees access that content or our application on a Saturday at 11 o'clock at night, they're not going to come back to us and ask us to pay for their phone yes. and that time they spent on the phone. Um, but it actually, you know, it's funny because when we first started envisioning what this looked like, we thought it would be this huge daunting task. Creating those channels and creating those guidelines, I mean, it's, it's, it's been pretty manageable. Yeah, it's pretty manageable. I mean, I think mm -hmm. our, our concern for our regional content coordinators that, that I don't directly oversee is to make sure they know the liability attendant on what Rosie was saying, that if we give the impression that we're saying something to an hourly employee, this is something you need to do on your own time, that we're possibly looking at unpleasant consequences from that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. making sure that everybody is kind of marching to the beat of the same drummer. And we haven't really had to confront that, but we will. We will. I mean, not directly, but we will sh soon. Yeah. yeah, totally. And the thing I'd add, I agree, is, um, you know, I think it's, there's no silver bullet. Like right now we have a legacy tool for social media um, workplace by Meta, um, which has its own problems. Um, but we know not everyone wants that because we did some data searching and we found out that a lot of people just don't want social media and they don't want it from work, which was an interesting tidbit we found. So I think like, doing what we can to get people engaging in the ways they want to, whether it's on our on workplace or on Mr. Connect or what have you. But I think it's also remembering 
it has to be a blend of things. Like we do old school posters, we do a weekly bundle of messages to all our GMs of all our stores. Like some of that like drumbeat stuff really helps too. Um, we're also looking into um, how can we get our hourly employees to opt into things because we know they don't want everything we blast at them. So like, how do we, they're busy, how do we help them decide and give them agency around what stuff we send them? We're, we're just in early days of trying to figure out how we do that. So Great. yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> I'm sure you know. The one thing I'll add too is I remember when we were talking about this and you know, we went to our legal team and we were like, okay, so what do we need to understand about these channels that are nice, you know, nice to know content. What does that mean? And you know, the one piece of feedback we kept getting from our executive leadership is like, well, nice to know information, you're gonna run out of content like in a month. You'd be amazed at how much content, it is endless. There's yeah. so much nice to know information we can come up with and we're like, we're a car wash. I mean, there's <laughs> any industry, I mean, there's so much stuff and you know, we've highlighted our career pathing opportunities, yeah. our success stories, and there's just so many. And we only have 7,000 employees. I mean, I know that there's some folks here. I mean, I can imagine how many stories you, your so folks many. might have. Yes. <laughs> totally. Great. Other questions? There's one. I see a hand over on the right side. There's two over there. Yeah. I see you behind the post. Hi. Um, I'm from B Senior Living. Huh? And yeah. I was just curious more for your app and platform users. Is there a certain percentage that you're looking for in terms of, you know how on the studio it says the percentage of views based on that? Is that something you go by as a success or is that something that kind of like knocks you down a bit with different posts or is it relatively high you're killing it? I mean, sometimes you, you think, man, this is gonna really nail it. And <laughs> does not and you go, geez, I guess I don't, have my finger on the pulse like I thought I did. <laughs> we, we have kind of a slightly weird situation that Rose and I were just complaining about before we came out where at our stores we have three managers. We have a GM, a manager, and an assistant manager. And only the GM always has email. And that means only the GM has an individual account for Mr. Connect. The other two managers share a store account. And I hate the store account. Yes. And the reason why <laughs> is because it wreaks havoc on our metrics. I so when I look at the activity of a post and I see X percent of people, right, which is the reach of all possible users, what I don't know is how many people who actually, like how many people are sharing a hit on the same account and it's not tracking that for unique users. I, for us, what we've kind of aligned at, and this is possibly unique to our organization, so don't take this as the gospel, is that if we're cracking 30% reach, that means we are doing a good job with that story. Yeah. If it's below 30% reach, it means it wasn't so hot. Beyond that, we've kind of moved from just reach. We also are really interested now in um, engagement. So we look a lot at comments. We take comments more seriously than just emojis, although that's also a thing that we look at. But we think if somebody's commenting that there's really something there that's getting them to pause and, and take a break and, and respond, so. Yeah, and one quick thing I'll add in this vein is it pays to make friends with your IT department and understand what your Microsoft licensing deal is because that's where like, hard no on people having teams or hard, like things that really impact the work that you do. So it seems super wonky, but it really pays to go like figure out what the deal is with licensing too. Um, I see folks yeah. coming in, which means that Soledad O'Brien is yeah. soon to take front and center. No, we still have six minutes. Um, <laughs> I, I wanna ask that big picture question. Um, so uh, Crystal Ball. We've been through a lot the past two, three years. We thought we were safe, and then something else came about. This is gonna keep on happening. Um, so we've, we've gotten to a really good place, I think, in internal communications. One, what's your future, what, how, where do you see the future of internal comms in your respective organizations, and how do we keep ourselves at the forefront of where we currently are, I think, in many of our organizations. Mm -hmm. I, I see, for Mr. Carwash, where we need to go is to 
enhance our role as educators within the organization. Um, we started off just being essentially publishers of stories and editors of stuff. We still do that, of course. That's always inherent in the role. Where we need to go is actually being strategic partners with everybody at, at our headquarters in Tucson and then even out into the regions and advising not just on how to pitch a message or how many articles to have or, or how to structure the cadence, but also timing and what to message. I mean, a, a consistent problem that I think we see is people in our organization, and this may be others, maybe yours as well, um, want to tell people everything. And we need to be able to say, you know what, you don't need to share six tenths of what you think you yeah. need to share, right? <laughs> this other stuff is the stuff that matters. That other stuff is just, eh. Um, so that's, I feel like that's where we need to go. Yeah, and I'll do you maybe one bigger even, which is I think what I've been seeing is, you know, internal comms is the stuff of, like you said, writing and editing, and that will always be part of it. But like I see big opportunity for us in thinking more broadly about the employee experience uh, in general. And I don't know about you all at your companies, but like, you know, I see there's huge gaps in engagement that no team is really picking up the ball. Like, who's who's building a strategy for remote worker engagement? Who's handling recognition, that amorphous thing? Like, thinking broadly about engagement, I think, and how to do that at your organization, which is like internal comms plus, I think is an interesting way that the that we can and should start thinking bigger because that's where the real mm -hmm. gains are, I think. Great, Rosie, do you have any? Um, I would echo everything that um, Diana and Lucas said. Um, also, I think any opportunity um, we can identify operationally where we can put this application in place to make our frontline employees' jobs easier and our customers' experience better and make our employees want to stay with us forever. Um, I think as long as we continue to do that with the evolution of the application and updates, um, I think we're winning. Yeah. So we could carry on for hours talking about analytics and the value of what we do. Um, I guess the, the bottom line is we now have the opportunity, we now have the information to make those decisions, to become the trusted partner to our leadership teams, to our organizations, and really keep ourselves um, elevated front and center. So sure. um, thank you all so much. Thank you. Really appreciate you being here.